I'm like sure that my kids were not involved in anything. <laughs> Про наших детей спрашивали, их быт, как они жили, чем занимались, чем интересовались. Michael, a mother tearfully proclaiming her son's innocence, yet authorities believe Tamerlan Sarnayev was radicalized somehow, somewhere. What are the leads investigators are following? I mean, the radicalization question here is probably the biggest one. If we had an answer to that, I think we'd probably all be able to take a day off, which we haven't had since the bombings. But the authorities are really digging in the hardest on this question. Who was it, what was it that caused this person oh, yeah. to do what he did and influence his brother? They're looking at his emails. They're talking to everyone he went to school with. They're over in Russia talking to everyone there they can. They're just they're just sort of fanning out and methodically and just going through as much as they can, you know, who he talked to, where he was. And from there, they're slowly starting to develop a picture. Was it 2010? Was it 2011? Was it 2012? I mean, that's the period of time that they're really focusing on, those three years. But it's going to take time, you know, and we're not going to have an answer. We're not going to have an answer for some time. Controversy is also swirling around the fact that Tamerlan traveled when he was on not one but two terror watch lists. Uh, did anyone drop the ball there? You know, post uh, pre 9 11, the thinking was that it was the lack of the FBI and CIA talking to each other that led to, to 9 11 and, and to some degree. Uh, post 9 11, there was a directorate set up where they actually would talk to each other. Was there a failure to me communicate between the intelligence agencies? Well, let me walk you through sort of how the Russians and the U.S. were interacting about this man. In March of 2011, the FBI gets a request from the Russians that says, look, we think this guy may have been radicalized. He might be an extremist. Tell us what you have. The FBI does sort of a mini investigation. They look at databases that they have on folks like this. They look at the websites he was going to. They talk to his family and they talk to him. And in and by August of 2011, they go back to the Russians and they say, look, we don't have anything. We don't, we don't have anything to show that this person's an extremist. At that point, the FBI says, look, if you have anything else, give it to us. The Russians don't give them anything. The FBI goes back a few weeks later and they say, look, hey, give us anything you have on this guy. You know, and if, if you have more, we might be able to do more. The Russians don't give them anything. And then a month later, the Russians, apparently because they were still concerned about this guy for some reason, which we don't know, they went to the CIA and they said, hey, what do you have on this guy? And the CIA did a mini investigation themselves looking at what their files and their databases. And that came back with nothing as well. And they went back to the Russians and said, hey, we don't have anything. The FBI finds out about this and they went back to the Russians again and said, hey, if you have anything, give it to us. And the Russians never gave him anything, and he never popped up, you know, on the radar of the FBI until last week. And we haven't heard from the Russians kind of a retort to why they never gave either American intelligence agency more if they had more to give. They may not have had more. They may not have had more. But also, you've got to understand, these are two different governments here. And even though they coordinate a lot on criminal matters and on terrorism and stuff, they still don't want to share everything they have with each other. So that might have been the thing that got in the way of these two governments communicating more effectively on this issue. All right, Mike, thanks so much. Questions we'll keep asking. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me.